thrilled to be here, and uh, I mean that very genuinely. You know, I was thinking about this morning, I thought, today is a day for dreaming. And what you need to know is that a lot of people, there are about 200 plus nations around the world, countries around the world. And when I was telling people that I was coming to Cape Town, South Africa, a lot of people I talked to, in fact, most everybody I talked to, said, it's my dream to go to Cape Town, South Africa. Isn't it neat that you get to live in a, in a city and a nation that other people dream of coming to? But here's my challenge for you today. My dream for you as a result of today is that you would build a church that would build a nation that would allow you to accomplish your dreams by living here, not visiting here. Wouldn't it be great if this nation was one that allowed all of you to accomplish your dreams in the context of the nation, not just visitors to come here to see it? So let's talk about it. Have a seat. Yeah, please. So I want to tell you about my dream as a 21-year-old kid coming out of college. My dream was to go out, make a lot of money, because my dream was to retire early, age 35 to be precise. I showed up and met a man named Truett Cathy at Chick-fil-A. And instead of finding the job that I could retire from early, I found something far more remarkable than that. I found the job I wouldn't want to retire from. See, I didn't even realize that existed as a 21-year-old kid. That didn't even exist in my mind. And I want to share with you what could it look like for you to find the job or you to create the job you wouldn't want to retire from. So it starts with a few thoughts that uh, like 80% of what we do at Chick-fil-A is exactly what our competitors do. Nothing different. But 20% of what we do is dramatically different. And that's what I want to focus on today. So let's take a look at a couple thoughts. Albert Einstein, one of the greatest mathematicians. I don't know if we have any financial people in the room, but if you're a financial person, you know, this is a guy that made his living crunching numbers, spreadsheets, formulas, all that. But even he realized that not everything that can be counted counts. And not everything that counts can be counted. See, in the world of business, we tend to reduce everything to numbers on a spreadsheet. But even Albert Einstein realized there's more to it than numbers on a spreadsheet. And I think most of the people we compete against just see their business as numbers on a spreadsheet. But fortunately, the, the leader, Truett Cathy, and the people at Chick-fil-A see well beyond the numbers. We've got to be really good at the numbers on the spreadsheet, but we see beyond that to those things that really count and can be counted on to build a business. Okay, here's a piece of remarkable advice I got early on and really learned from watching Truett and other people live out their life. There are riches money can't buy. See, the reason I wanted to make a lot of money retire because I thought all the riches in life just required money and I realized and learned there are riches money can't buy. And in the end, these are the riches that will really matter. I had a chance to witness the end of a great man's life. True Kathy died in 2014. At his funeral, no one talked about the size of his bank account. Everyone talked about the size of his impact on their life. That's the legacy he left behind. Not, you know, the true riches in life will never be found in a bank account. They're found in the richness of our relationships with each other and our impact on each other's lives. Um, Truett lived his life this way. This was his favorite Bible verse. If you ever got a, a, a book from Truett, he would sign it this way. Proverbs 22.1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. If you want to build a remarkable business, you don't focus on the riches it's creating. You focus on the good name that you're creating for yourself and your business in the context of how you're doing business. See, I never heard Truett talk about great riches. I often heard Truett talk about a good name. He wanted his name to be a good name. He wanted our name collectively to be a good name. And sure enough, the day he died, Chick-fil-A is now one of the top 10 brands in the United States. 
and, and uh, it, it didn't start that way. When, I, I probably should share this with you. When I started at Chick-fil-A, 21 years old, it was in a converted air freight warehouse that the, uh, the corporation was, and they had about 20 people on the staff. It was, you know, a fraction the size of this room. They'd run out of room, so they cut a hole through the wall, pulled up a mobile home, and my first office was in a mobile home attached to a warehouse. That didn't look like a good name company at the time. You know, that didn't look like a company that would one day be on the Forbes list of the top 10 most inspirational companies in the United States. You know, it didn't look like one that would be on the Wall Street Journal cover winning uh, awards for hospitality and all these other things. A good name, rather to be chosen than great riches. All right. As a marketing guy, I spent almost my whole career in marketing at Chick-fil-A. This was my favorite quote. Advertising is the tax we pay for a product or service that's unremarkable. Advertising is the tax we pay for a product or service that's unremarkable. Most of the people that, that I compete against think advertising is the thing. You know, and the more money we throw at it, the better. I used to joke with Truett, I said, I guess that puts me in the tax evasion business. And I would always want a lawyer present when I would say that. But I viewed my job as to spend as little money as possible to get the maximum return, not as much money as possible. Because sometimes limiting our resources enhances the creativity behind it. We, you know, there was a, a presidential candidate one time, uh, he was a multi-billionaire, a guy named Ross Perot, he said this, he said, the more money I have, the stupider I get. And what he meant by that, I had to process that for a while, what he meant by that is, the more money I have, the more money I throw at things. You know, instead of using gray matter, I use in the U.S. what we call green matter, or a dollar bill. I throw a lot of money at it hoping to solve it versus using a lot of gray matter to solve it. Um, a number of years ago, I, I knew that Truett was getting close to the end of his life, and I wanted to capture a lot of what I'd learned from Truett along the way. So I decided to write a book because someone shared this with me. They said the book that will impact you the most is not the one you read. It's the one you write. And when you think about it, why is that? Well, in order to write a book, you've got to take all these things that are kind of misty in your mind and make them crystal clear. And you've got to communicate them in a way other people can understand it. So it's really an exercise in crystallizing your own thinking. And it has more impact on you than anyone else. And honestly, it just started as an exercise in crystallizing my own thinking. I wanted to be really clear about what I'd learned and capture it all. Well, as it turned out, we just self-published it, myself and another guy, and all of a sudden, they started selling a ton of books. And so then a couple publishers approached us, and, uh, we just, and they bought the rights to the book and then republished it under their label. And this next time around, because someone else was, you know, their, their money was now at stake, and so I thought, i got to get serious about promoting this book this time. So at the time, uh, I was thinking about how could I do something more remarkable to release this book? And it just so happened at that time, it was December uh, of that year, and I noticed that when people want to get people interested in a movie, they create movie trailers, right? It's like you see this little snippet of the movie, and then you want to go see the whole thing. I thought, what about if we did a movie trailer for a book? I thought that could be an interesting way to promote this book. And it might go viral, and, you know, it, we wouldn't have to spend any advertising money. Well, what really made me interested in it is my son Daniel, who was 16 at the time, is now studying filmmaking at university, but that time he's very interested in videos, and I thought this could be a fun father-son project to work on. So I got really motivated because I said, if I can get Daniel involved, we're going to take the message of this book, and we're going to get it here and here. Any of you that ever made a video know you've got to go over and over and over the material. And I thought, this will be worth it. It'll be a fun father-son project. Let Daniel make the video. And then we brought in the son of another guy, another guy named Daniel. So the two Daniels went to work and created a video. And I want to just share that video with you right now to give you like a teaser about the book. But more importantly, this video is a little bit the story of my life. The first part of the video is kind of portrays the American dream. What I grew up thinking I wanted my remarkable future to look like, the first part of the video. Maybe you'll relate to the first part of the video. But the second part of the video is what I learned was a far more remarkable way to live than what I was thinking when I started with Chick-fil-A. So pay attention to the beginning, but also watch 
how this, this story twists and turns at the end. So let's take a look at this quick little video that Daniel Salyers uh, helped his dad produce as a 16-year-old kid. Isn't that a great message for a 16-year-old kid, 21-year-old kid, 51-year-old kid? You know, it's a great message for anybody because working for Chick-fil-A totally reprogrammed my thinking about what success looked like. And, and to go from a self-enriching exercise to using business as a platform to enrich the lives of others. But here's what's really cool. On the other end of this, you know, we created that little video, and Daniel was pretty proud of it, and the other Daniel that he worked with, which was the son of a friend of mine, the two Daniels were really happy. But when we put that out there, the day that the book debuted, number one bestseller on Amazon, ahead of one of my favorite books, Good to Great. And I thought, what an amazing thing for a father, for a 16-year-old kid to help his dad, and that ends up being the result. It becomes a best-selling book on its very first day. So, nothing is as commonplace as to wish to be remarkable. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that. And the operative word there is wish. See, we all grow up wishing that someday we're going to make our mark on this world. You know, we're going to do something worth remarking about. We're, we're going to be somebody. We're going to do something. We all grow up 
with that dream of being somebody and marking the, you know, this world in a special way. But for a lot of people, the operative word there, it just remains a wish. It doesn't become reality. And it kind of begs the question, why is it there are so few remarkable businesses? Why are there so few remarkable organizations? And most importantly, why are there so few remarkable jobs? Well, I think I've got a theory about this. I think it's hard to create a remarkable organization based on an unremarkable premise. And we're going to dig into what that unremarkable premise, particularly in business, looks like in just a few minutes. But Jim Collins, a uh, uh, famous business author, probably the most prolific business thinker in the United States right now, a Stanford University professor, has written a number of books. This was my favorite, Good to Great. I read this book four times, and it wasn't until the fourth time through that I caught this statement. I'm amazed I missed it the first three times through, but the fourth time through, I caught this statement. It says, true greatness comes in direct proportion to passionate pursuit of money, right? Did I miss something? What did I miss? A purpose beyond money. A purpose beyond money. See, every business exists to make money, no exceptions, including Chick-fil-A. But not every business has a purpose beyond money for which they exist. And that, Jim Collins found, was the big differentiator. The great businesses, 100%, had a purpose beyond money for which they existed. And all the others just existed to make money. So let me be clear. All businesses exist to make money, but not all businesses have a purpose beyond money for which they exist. And to have a purpose beyond money is what puts you in position to potentially become one of the great, or as I would put it, one of the remarkable businesses. Okay, I want to give you two ideas to help each of you walk out of here just a bit more remarkable, and we're going to unpack that word in just a few minutes. Perspective and the maximum of creativity. So let's jump into perspective. Perspective is simply this, how we view things drives how we do things. How we see something has an incredible impact on the way we respond to it and what we do about it, the way we see it. Now, I'm going to do something no speaker worth their salt would ever do. I'm going to take something that simple and I'm going to make it a lot more complicated, which is the exact opposite of what they teach you to do in a speech class. We're going to take this, but I think by making it more complicated, we're going to make it more helpful. So let's do it this way. Perspective is the only thing in the world that can radically transform the results you get without altering a single element of your environment. Perspective is the only thing in the world that can radically transform the results you get without altering a single element of your environment. So let me translate that for you. When you walk out of here today, nothing has to change. The government doesn't have to change, your boss doesn't have to change, your neighbors don't have to change, your community doesn't have, nothing has to change but your perspective and everything can change for you. I'm so convinced of this. I'm convinced this is one of the most important business principles I've ever run into. So a few years ago, I said, this is so important that I want the staff that I work with at Chick-fil-A to really get what we mean by this. And what you have to understand is, outside of the, my personal family, the people I work with at Chick-fil-A are the people I love most on the face of the earth. You know, a lot of people in America particularly can't comprehend that because they show up every day to people who are there to stab them in the back. I show up every day to people who have my back. And I've got their back. So understand, as I'm saying this, this is not the norm. This is very different than the norm. But we have a 97% retention rate at Chick-fil-A. 97% of the people who have come, still there. 97% retention rate. This is one of the reasons why. is because we love each other. We have each other's best interest in mind. So because I love them so much, I wanted them to really get this. So a few years ago at a staff meeting, I said, I'm... You know, if perspective is so important and how we view things drives how we do things, I want my staff to understand how I view them. And so I say I owe it to them to let them know how I view them because how I view them will drive what I do with and for them. 
So I said, what about if I write a letter to them about my perspective of them? And so I said, I'm going to write kind of a love letter from a leader to the staff. And then we made a video out of it. And I want to play that video for you right now. And then I want to ask you a question. So let's take a look at a love letter from a leader. As you're watching this, I want you to think, how would you feel and what would be going through your mind if this is the letter your leader wrote to you? Let's take a look. We are part of a me generation, and I refuse to accept that we can do great things together. I know this may surprise you, but happiness comes from loving others is a lie, and looking out for yourself will make you happy. So in the years to come, we will tell our contemporaries they are not the most important thing in our life. Chick-fil-A will know that we have the right perspective because getting what we want is more important than serving others. I tell you this, once upon a time, we cared for one another, but this will not be true of our department. This is a stagnant and detached group. The experts tell us 30 years from now, we will be further isolated. We do not concede that we can make a difference. In the future, rampant self-indulgence will be the norm. No longer can it be said that you and I love God and each other. It'll be evident that our generation is apathetic and lethargic. It is ridiculous to presume that there is hope. So, how you feeling? You feeling the love right now? You know, if that was the letter you got from your boss, might mean you'd be dusting off, uh, we would call it a resume uh, in the U.S., but uh, maybe looking for another job or something? Well, would it surprise you if I told you every single word you just saw on that screen is 100% true of the team I work with at Chick-fil-A. How we reconcile that? Well, let's take a look. There is hope. It is ridiculous to presume that our generation is apathetic and lethargic. It'll be evident that you and I love God and each other. No longer can it be said that rampant self-indulgence will be the norm. In the future, we can make a difference. We do not concede that 30 years from now we will be further isolated. The experts tell us this is a stagnant, detached group, but this will not be true of our department. We cared for one another once upon a time. I tell you this, serving others is more important than getting what we want. We have the right perspective because Chick-fil-A will know that they are not the most important thing in our life. So in the years to come, we will tell our contemporaries, looking out for yourself will make you happy is a lie, and happiness comes from loving others. I know this may surprise you, but we can do great things together, and I refuse to accept that we are part of a me generation. Now do you believe me? What's amazing about that is not one word on the screen changed, did it? The only thing that changed was what? Our perspective. Now, for some of you in the audience, you're saying, well, that's a cute little video gimmick from a chicken salesman from Atlanta. <laughs> and that perspective would be right. It is a cute little video gimmick from a chicken salesman in Atlanta. But let me share with you, it is absolutely true that this is true of life. So let me give you a more graphic, hard-edged example. At Chick-fil-A, we compete in one of the most ferocious categories imaginable in U.S. business. We have 200 competitors, you know, major chains that we compete against. It's known, you know, you collectively put all the advertising together, it's the biggest advertising spend of any category in the United States. You know, there's price competition, there's always things going on, so it's just this dog-eat-dog -dog world that we compete in. Last year, the average fast food company did about $800,000 in sales, or, or turnover, I believe is the word you use, per restaurant. So $800,000 was the norm for those 200 restaurant competitors. McDonald's, which you're very familiar with, is arguably the gold standard in our industry. McDonald's last year did $2.5 million per restaurant, three times the average of the industry. So they are fantastic organization, fantastic competitors. Now, perspective, how we view things drives how we do things. Of those, two competitors, of those 200 competitors, 199 of them look at the day Sunday and they conclude good day to be open. And you know what? If you just put the numbers on the spreadsheet, 
their perspective is correct. Generally speaking, Sunday is the busiest day of the week for most restaurants in the U.S. So that's a great perspective. Chick-fil-A looks at the same day with a very different perspective. Chick-fil-A has decided Sunday is a good day to be closed. Oh, oh okay. That, uh, sorry about that. Chick-fil-A decided Sunday, great day to be closed because we believe there are more important things in life than selling another chicken sandwich. We want our employees to spend time with their families. We want our employees to have a day off to go to church, all these other things. There are more important things. So out of 200 competitors, one decides to close on Sunday. That perspective leads to very different results. So $800,000 is the norm per restaurant. McDonald's, 2.5 million. Can you believe Chick-fil-A last year did $5 million per restaurant in 52 less days, 52 less of the best days? And if you asked anybody from Chick-fil-A, the single best way to kill Chick-fil-A would be to open on Sunday because it would be such a violation of the, of the cultural norms and what we believe in, and the mission that we're on, and the purpose that we have. You know, and so it's amazing how we view things drives how we do things. So, perspective. Transformational growth in any person or organization, transformational growth in you personally, or the organization you're part of, or the organization you lead, begins with a transformational perspective of what you're doing, or of who you are. You want to transform yourself, transform your perspective. So the perspective of Chick-fil-A, in my opinion, that's transforming our business is our mission to be remarkable. Now, what's fascinating to me about this mission is I've been at Chick-fil-A for over 37 years. We've been through lots of missions. Most of them looked exactly like what a business school professor would want. You know, by this date, we're going to have this number of sales, and we're going to do all these things, you know, all the traditional things. If you turn that mission statement into a, a, a business school professor's class for your paper or whatever, for your, you know what you would get, the grade you would get for that mission statement? Big fat F. You know, you would fail because it doesn't meet any of the norms. And interestingly, that's kind of the Chick-fil-A story about how we succeed is we do counterintuitive things. We do things that are countercultural. We do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. They all open on Sunday, we close. Same thing with this mission statement. This has been the most counterintuitive mission statement we've ever had. We adopted that mission statement about five years ago, and the last five years have been the best five years at Chick fil A by any stretch, by any measure, by a large margin. You know, if, if our sales were going like this, we've never had a year of sales, by the way, that were less than the year before. 100% growth every year. Not 100% growth, but 100% of the time we have grown every year. But if you were graphing it over time, it looked like this, and the last five years looked like this. Sales profit ever since we adopted this mission statement. And I think this mission statement has been jet fuel for the corporate engine. So let me explain what this means and what it doesn't mean. Maybe the easiest way to understand what Be Remarkable means to us is to understand what it doesn't mean. What it doesn't mean is stand on the stage, beat our chest, stretch our arms out, and say, look how remarkable we are. In fact, it's the exact opposite of that. What Be Remarkable means to us is we want to mark the lives of the people we serve. And at the end of the day, at the end of our careers, we want to look back on a career that was worth remarking about. And let me tell you, selling chicken sandwiches, fries, and drinks is not worth remarking about. That's not worth investing my life in. So we want to have, be on a mission and do things that are marking the lives of people and making a mark on this world. We want to use our business platform to make a mark, not just make money. And so Be Remarkable is all about that. How do we mark the lives of the people we serve? How do we do things worth remarking about? And if we do it remarkably enough... Advertising will be a tax we pay for a product or service that's unremarkable. The better we do at this, the less we got to spend on advertising. So, but there's a big problem if you think about it. This would be a great mission statement if, our, if we were one of these sexy high-tech companies. 
This would be a great mission statement if we were curing cancer. You know, this would be a great mission statement if we were bringing water to Africa and all these things. But we're a fast food company. You know, here's our problem. We're fast food. In the United States, this is like the, the job you would take if you couldn't find any other job. We're like the lowliest of the low. There's an adage in the U.S. that says, if I can't do anything else, I can always flip burgers for a living. It's like, it's, it's the lowest job imagine one. What I found is God sometimes uses the lowest and the, the least of these to do his greatest work. So we felt like, hey, we're kind of the least of these. Maybe we could be the ones that do some of the greatest work. So we've turned around the fact, and I want to encourage you, probably everybody in here works for something better than what we do. And so you got more of a shot at being remarkable than we have. So, I've got a theory, you know, like we talked about earlier, that it's hard to create a remarkable organization based on an unremarkable premise. Let me show you the unremarkable premise that most businesses are built on. Most businesses think of business as a get-rich scheme. Most businesses are started because someone wants to get rich, and that's their premise. And so if they're going to get rich, they're going to get rich off of someone, right? So who are they going to get rich off of? Well, they're going to get rich off their customers. They're going to get rich off their employees. They're going to get rich off their vendors. They're going to get rich off the communities they serve. So they see business as a win-lose proposition. I'm going to win, you're going to lose. And that's the way it's framed in their mind, perspective. How we view things drives how we do things. And I don't deny that a lot of businesses do think that way, and most of them operate that way. It's why in the U.S. particularly, Business has such a bad reputation. What I do challenge, though, is, does it have to be that way? Is that the only way? Is that the only perspective? And I would challenge you that there are other perspectives. And so a more remarkable perspective, and I feel like what I've witnessed over the last 37 years, is a very different perspective of business. And it's this. Business as a be-rich opportunity, not a get-rich opportunity. See, being rich and getting rich are totally opposite, you know, just polar opposites. Being rich is about enriching the lives of others. Getting rich is about enriching our own life at their expense. Being rich is about using our platform of business as a way to enrich the communities we serve, as a way to enrich the lives of our team members, as a way to enrich the lives of our customers, as a way to enrich even the lives of our suppliers. If you view it that way, you will do it that way, and your results, I assure you, will be far more remarkable. So, in the Bible, it talks about this. In 1 Timothy, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. You know, my dream for Chick-fil-A is that's the way people would describe Chick-fil-A. I don't know many businesses I would describe that way. In fact, most businesses I would describe the opposite way. You know, they're not rich in good deeds. They're not generous. They're not willing to share. It's all self-enrichment proposition. Does that make sense? This, to me, would be a great description. I would love for you to describe Chick-fil-A. This is the way we try and live and and live out our business at Chick-fil-A. To be remarkable, we've got to think differently. And what's interesting, it's usually the reverse of what other people think. I spent my whole career, and we spent our whole life... We start with what is the competition doing? How are they thinking? Now, we're going to do the opposite of that. What a lot of people do is they study the competition and they imitate what the competition is doing. What we do is we study the competition and we innovate what they're doing. See, innovation will get you a competitive advantage. Imitation will make you a commodity. Okay. We need to be thought leaders to be market leaders. Dan Cathy said this in a staff meeting one time. I just wrote it down and made a slide. I love this idea. The reason I love this idea is we tend to think in business, the way we're going to be the market leader is we've got to have more money and throw more money at things. You know, we've got to be the biggest in order to be the best. But what I've found is it's not a money issue. It's not a green matter. You know, U.S. dollars are green. So, I, In fact, I have to pull one out here. Hang on. We get very caught up with this in U.S. business. We think just throwing enough at this will solve all of our problems. But what this told me is 
Being a th thought leader is a gray matter issue. It's a red matter issue. Gray matter, red matter, trump green matter all day long. So if we want to be a thought leader, we don't have to be the person in the room with the, or, or a market leader, excuse me. We don't have to be the person in the room with the most money. We got to be the person in the room that thinks the most about it and has the most heart behind it. And everybody can do that. Not everybody can have the most of this. But anybody in this room can apply this and this, and you can become the market leader. Um, Here's a perspective. The definition of a remarkable business. How would we know if we were becoming a remarkable business? Well, I'm a simple chicken salesman, so I like things really simple. And a number of years ago, I ran across a fill-in-the-blank sentence that brought crystallization in my mind to what it looks like to be a remarkable business. And it's this. I can't imagine my life without blank in it. I can't imagine my life without blank in it. So let me start. Um, by uh, maybe confessing uh, the fact. Uh, how many of you, first of all, are coffee drinkers? Oh, I'm, I'm so in admiration of you. I, I so wish I was a coffee drinker. You have baristas. You get to syrups and half calves and coffee art and all this stuff. I start every day with a simple Coke Zero, sadly. <laughs> sadly, I've confessed it. Will you forgive me? Pastor Phil, will you forgive me for that sin? But that's my caffeine fix in the morning, sadly. But I can't imagine my life, and my son would attest, and Vessel would attest. In fact, I start every day with a simple Coke Zero. But I can't imagine my life without that. I can't imagine my life without Apple computer in it. You know, I've got a Mac Air. I've got a, an Apple Watch, an iPhone. I literally I can't imagine. I can't imagine my life without North Point Community Church in it. You know, it's a, it's a thing that's had an incredible impact on me, my family, all this. I can't imagine my life without my wife, Lynn, and my three kids in it. On and on and on it goes. Whatever I would put in that blank are, in fact, the remarkable things in my life. Whatever you would put in that blank are the remarkable things in your life. So here's the challenge. What about if we thought that my job as, as head of marketing and growth at Chick-fil-A is not to grow sales, it's to grow the number of people putting the word Chick-fil-A in that blank. Wouldn't that be different? If I took this half of the room and I said, your job is to go out and brainstorm ways to get people to spend 30 cents more at Chick-fil-A. And I took this half of the room, I said, your job is to come up with ways that more and more people would put the word Chick-fil-A in that blank. And you came back to report on your ideas, I don't think there'd be one idea that would be the same, would it? See, how we view things drive. If we think our job is to get people to spend 30 cents more, that's the ideas we'll pursue. If we think our job is to get more people to put Chick-fil-A in that blank, those are the ideas we'll pursue. Perspective. How we view things drives how we do things. All right, here's one. Uh, Phil and I share this. We think that culture is the ultimate competitive advantage. I'll tell you, if I had to leave Chick-fil-A tomorrow and I could only take one thing with me, and I had to be successful, it wouldn't be the sandwich, it wouldn't be the beautiful restaurants, it wouldn't be the beautiful corporate headquarters, it would be the culture. And I'm convinced I could replant that culture in another business, and it would be eminently successful. That's how important culture is. But how would we know if we had a remarkable culture? You know, if we're going to talk about it, it's such an amorphous word, it's so hard to pin down, it's so squishy to think about what is culture, and how do we make it more tangible? So I've got a definition, doesn't need to be yours, but I would encourage you, you need to have a definition of what a remarkable culture. But let me just share with you my definition, the one I've used, and tell you how I apply it to what we do. So my definition is this. It's a place where people believe the best in each other, so they want the best for each other, and expect the best from each other. They believe the best in each other, want the best for each other, and expect the best from each other. So let's start not applying it to business, but I, I know we've uh, we got some sports fans. We've probably got people who played sport. Think about the best team you were ever on. Wouldn't that be a great description of that team? That team believed in each other. They wanted something for each other, usually a championship, and they expected the best from each other. I don't know what kind of family you grew up in, but regardless of the family you grew up in, wouldn't you want 
parents who believe the best in you, wanted the best for you, and expected the best from you. See, this is a great de definition of culture before we ever get to business. But let me apply it to business for a minute and show where business people typically get this wrong. In business, we love that last line. We expect the best from you. And in fact, we're so intent on that and so intentional about that that we put together a three-page job description that you get handed during the interview process or on your first day. And we just say, do everything on this three pages with excellence, and you'll get a paycheck every couple weeks. And that's the sum total of the relationship a lot of people have with their business. I do everything on the three page with excellence, they throw a paycheck at me every. And that's why so many jobs are unremarkable. So contrast that with this. If you were to interview for Chick-fil-A, first of all, it would be about a 12 to 24 month process. We, it'd take a long time to get into Chick-fil-A. And we'd be really serious because we have that 97% retention rate. We know if we hire you, there's a 97% chance you're going to be with us for a long time. And I'm going to be responsible for that if I bring you into the organization. So I'm serious about this. What we say most people want to date you, most companies want to date you, Chick-fil-A wants to marry you. You know, it's a longer term proposition. So you take it differently when you view it that way. How we view things drives how we do things. So, but when I know that we're getting close is when I really believe in you as a candidate. I'm not going to bring you into our organization if I don't believe in you. If I'm sitting across the table from someone like you, sir, and I think, man, look at what's coming out of his mouth. Look at the quality of character he has. Look at the competence he has. Look at the chemistry we have. I would want to be surrounded by that guy. One of the things that Truett used to tell me is, if we will become like those we surround ourselves with, for better or for worse. So one question I'm always asking myself in the interview process, is this someone I want to be surrounded by? Am I going to get better as a result of them being in this organization? Because I want to get better. And I need to be surrounded by excellence. But more importantly, more important, far more importantly, remember I told you the people at Chick-fil-A, outside of my family, are the people I love most on the face of the earth. They need to be surrounded by excellence. And that's my responsibility. It's no different than wanting my, my kids to be surrounded by excellent people. I feel the same way about the people at Chick-fil-A. Just like I want my kids to be surrounded by excellence, I want the people at Chick-fil-A to be surrounded by excellence. One way I know that we're getting close on this is when that person leaves my office, I can't get them off my mind. A week later, two weeks later, I'm still thinking about them thinking, how are we going to get them on our staff? We've got to have that person. And because I know they're going to make me better, I know they're going to make the rest of our team better. So we need to be thoroughly convinced. You know, there was a point in my career I thought, this isn't fair that I've got to believe in them. And I thought, isn't that a little selfish on my part? You know, what about if we just don't have good chemistry? But I realize, as their leader, if I don't believe in them, they will pick up on that very quickly. And everyone else will pick up on it. And they'll feel kind of like the black sheep in the group. So we've got to have enough chemistry where all of us really believe in each other. The second, want things for each other. Let me tell you how this plays out. When we're getting close to the end of the interview process, the final interview with me would go something like this. What's your name, sir? Jason, I'm going to pick on you, Jason, if you don't mind. Jason, you're in the final interview. We're 24 months into this, so you're on the fast track. Could have been 36 months. <laughs> and so Jason, you know, the conversation goes something like this. Jason, we have been thoroughly evaluating you, and we are thoroughly impressed. You know, I am dying to have you join this team, and the rest of the team can't wait for the day you start. We are 100% convinced you're going to make us so much better, and we are thrilled at the prospect of you joining the team. And Jason... I want you to get paychecks that are going to blow your mind. Paychecks you never imagined. You know, paychecks that are ever increasing in size. And Jason, I want your paycheck to be the least important thing you ever get from Chick-fil-A. If I do my job well, your paycheck will be the least important thing you ever get from Chick-fil-A. So Jason, you don't have to answer this, this rhetorical. So Jason... What would need to be true about your life? What would need to be true about your dreams? What would need to be true about who you're becoming? What would need to be true about what you're accomplishing? What would be need, need to be true about what you're doing and who you're... I'd ask a series of questions, a long list of questions. And I wouldn't stop asking those kinds of questions until I've got three pages of notes. 
about your dreams, your aspirations, your remarkable future, all that you want to accomplish in life, not just at Chick-fil-A, holistically. And when I finish taking three pages of notes about Jason, you know what I've just done? I've created my job description as it relates to Jason. If I'm going to give him a three-page job description, I feel like I need to have a three-page job description. So Jason, let me ask you a question. If you had been at this for 24 months and you were thoroughly convinced I believed in you, if you were thoroughly convinced after I showed you the three pages, probably outside of your spouse, I may love you more than anyone else or your family. You know, I really, you were thoroughly convinced that I love you. I want things for you. I want you to have that bright future you articulated to me. And I'm going to be the world's greatest expert on you and helping you accomplish all those things you just told me about. If those two things were true, would you not readily give me the best from you? Would that be like a no-brainer for you? See, I think it's almost immoral to expect the best from people but not believe in them and not want things for them. As a leader, I've got to believe in people. I've got to want things for them before I expect things from them. Does that make sense? This, for me, is a 97% retention rate. You know, this is how we do it. This is how we create a culture that's remarkable. If you were surrounded by people every day, if you showed up every day to work, to people who believed in you, were helping you accomplish what you wanted to do in life, and expected the best from you. That's important too. If you're not doing your best, you'll never be totally happy. Well, you got to be contributing. And you got to be doing your very best. But if all three things are true, that, ladies and gentlemen, for me, looks like a remarkable culture. That's how you build a church. That's how you build a nation. That's how you build a business. So, how we view things drives how we do things. Let's take a look at the maximum of creativity real quick. Maximum of creativity says this. I believe God designed us to create value in life. That real joy, real satisfaction exists in the context of creating value for other people. You know, the Bible talks about it's better to give than to receive. You know, this is a reflection of that. That we were born, we were put on the face of this earth to create value for other people. So the problem is that we're surrounded by two approaches to life. One seeks to extract value from everyone. We've all run into people like this, haven't we? You just feel like their only mission in life, their only motive is to extract value from me. And then other people have learned, no, it's far more joyous to create value for others. The problem in business particularly is that the gravitational pull of business, if left unchecked, kind of the natural way it will go, unless you intentionally go a different direction, is this. It will lead us to focus on extracting value. Almost by definition, I was taught in business school, the purpose of a business is to maximize profitability or maximize shareholder value. So naturally with that as your perspective, you'll be focused on extracting value. So a transformational view of business looks like this. The normal view of business is to extract value. We spend all day in meetings and seminars like this. How are we going to get people to spend more with us? The remarkable view is we create value. The normal view is we exist as a business to create a sale. You know what the remarkable perspective on that same issue would be? At Chick-fil-A, we exist to create a fan. In fact, we call them raving fans. Every day we start the day, we say, our job is to create raving fans today of our business, not create a sale. Normal businesses, think about increasing shareholder value like we talked about. This is a tough one because this is true. Part of the reason a business exists is to increase shareholder value. But it's also what I would call a half-truth. And a half-truth are the most dangerous truths because they're half-true. See, it is true you need to increase shareholder value if you have a business or you own a business, you run a business, you do have to do that. But it's an incomplete truth because in my view, business is an ecosystem and business has stakeholders. And see, I think instead of increasing shareholder value, which is increasing the value on the part of one piece of the ecosystem, maybe at the expense of the others, that increasing shareholder, excuse me, stakeholder value Stakeholders are everyone who has a stake in the success of that business. So shareholders are one group that has a stake, but also team members have a stake, customers have a stake, communities have a stake, 
Suppliers have a stake. And if, if it's increasing shareholder value, then sometimes we can be tempted to think, I'm going to win as a shareholder because my team is going to lose, my customers are going to lose, my suppliers are going to lose, my community is going to lose. So it's kind of a win-lose proposition. But what this says is increasing stakeholder value is a win-win-win-win proposition. The stakeholders or the shareholders are going to win. Customers are going to win. Team members are going to win. Suppliers are going to win. Communities are going to win as a result of this business. And if you view it that way, you will do it that way. Does that make sense? So, a normal business thinks a lot about a P&L and making a dollar. I'm sorry, a, a dollar is the U.S., yeah, a rand. Make a, make a rand. Uh, but remarkable businesses think about business as a platform to make a difference. See, not a platform to make a dollar, a platform to make a difference. So a number of years ago, we were trying to say, we've got about 150 or 60,000 employees now across the United States. So how do you make sure all those employees understand this? Well, let me show you what the employees of a lot of our competitors look like. If you were to walk in today to a U.S. fast food restaurant and you were armed with some of this green stuff, this is what you would look like. They, you, they've been trained to think of you as a human ATM machine designed to spit money across the counter. You know, they think of you as a dollar bill, and, and what they've been trained to do is grab as much of that as they can and stuff it in the register. And if that's, that, that's their perspective, what starts to happen over time as a customer, my perspective becomes, I'm going to keep as much as I can. And so we've set business up as an adversarial relationship with our customers, where there's a winner and a loser if that's the perspective. So my challenge is, what about, I'm not suggesting it's not that way, you wouldn't have to go past the first fast food place in America and it, it, you'd feel that way. I am suggesting, can it be another way? And a number of years ago we were saying, well what would it look like? What, what perspective would we have with our customers? So we created a video for these team members and I wanted to share, this is like an internal training video that we use at Chick-fil-A. I want you to see how the employees would view you when you walk in to a Chick-fil-A restaurant. Let's take a look.
it true that every life has a story? Every life is a story. So what about if we totally took a different perspective on business? What about if we thought about it this way? What if we made it our goal to improve the story for those we do business with? That's what we showed up to do every day. Our goal is to improve the story for those we do business with. Because everyone who walks into our business has a story and everyone's got a challenge. Everyone's overcoming things in life. What about if our business became the one that helps them with that? So a number of years ago, I was out in Kansas City and I ran into one of our operators and uh, we had just watched the video that you just watched. And we started talking about the fact one of the things he has to compete against is 99 cent kids meals. And we're like, wow, how do we compete against that? And we thought about the video you just watched and we said, hey, if we really wanted to improve the lives of those kids, would a 99 cent kids meal be the way we would do it? And we thought we're better than that. We can come up with something better than that. In fact, to do that would just be to imitate our competition. What can we do to innovate? And fortunately for me, this guy was a father of three daughters. And he said, you know, one of the things I love to do is take my daughters on daddy-daughter date night. He said, what about if instead of a 99-cent kids meal, I created a daddy-daughter date night for my customers? And honestly and transparently, as I, as I thought about that, I thought, that guy is brilliant. I get paid big bucks to come up with ideas like that. How did I miss that one? But I did recognize a good idea when I saw one. So we started brainstorming, and we decided to create this first-ever daddy-daughter date night. And uh, I, I left, and I got a phone call about two days later. He said, David, you're not going to believe this. He said, people in the community have heard about my daddy-daughter date night, and they're, volunteer they're calling to volunteer to help. Now, let that sink in for a minute. Probably everybody in this room has volunteered to help a nonprofit organization. I'll bet no one would raise their hand if those of you have volunteered to help a for-profit organization because most of us aren't doing anything worth volunteering for. Well, a florist had called um, and uh, wanted to, to donate flowers. A car wash called and wanted to wash the father's cars. A photographer called and wanted to come take pictures. On and on and on it went. So let me just fast forward you. Uh, what, what he figured out is uh, in order to maximize the opportunity, he was going to create reservations that night in 30-minute increments. And he figured he could create 700 reservations between like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 9 o'clock that night in 30-minute increments. So he put it on his website at 9 o'clock on a Friday morning a couple weeks out, came back to check the website 5 o'clock. Guess what had happened? Totally full. One day. And a waiting list started. Now, ladies, let's be honest. Who was really signing up for Daddy Daughter Date Night? Yeah, Mom. Dad came home that night and found out he's going on Daddy Daughter Date Night. Let me assure you, that's the way it happened in most cases. But let me also assure you this. As the father of a daughter, dad was thrilled. Every dad wants to be that dad. We just don't create the context for him to be that dad. So let me just walk you through what it looked like. That night, when you came in, the car wash folks, instead of washing cars, they decided to valet park cars. So people were out there valet parking, and they'd open the door for you. They'd open the door for your daughter. He had set up a red carpet with a tinted structure, and you would walk your daughter down the red carpet. About halfway through, there was a, a big container of carnations. You'd get a flower out and give it to your daughter. When they got inside, because they'd taken reservations, they'd set up a hostess stand. And the hostess was there and she'd say, Mr. Salyers, Miss Salyers, welcome to Chick-fil-A. Let's escort you to the table. And then they'd go escort the father and daughter to the table. Now, here's what got interesting. See, he wasn't doing this to make 30 cents more that night. He was doing it to improve the story of these dads and daughters. So he'd really thought about this. And what he realized in doing his homework is that when a father sits down with their young daughter, particularly like, uh, you know, seven, six, seven, eight years old, there's something that's about to not happen, ladies, if you can help me. It begins with a C. When a dad sits down with his daughter, what's about to not happen? A conversation. Most dads don't know what to talk to their young daughter about. So you know what he'd done? He, t he took a... Uh, placemat, and he'd gotten with a nonprofit organization. He said, give me some really good questions for a dad to ask a daughter. So he had a list of questions. He orchestrated the conversation effectively, had a list of questions for the dad to ask the daughter, and an empty line so the dad could record the answers to prove to mom they'd actually had a conversation. <laughs> and he did the same thing for the daughter. 
a list of questions to ask dad, the kind of questions she's probably not normally going to ask, and she would record those in her own handwriting. You know what he just created for that dad and that daughter? Something priceless. So, orchestrated the conversation they had, you know, all the rest, uh, and they escorted him out after 30 minutes, but the story didn't end there. They did a research afterwards. The normal response to research in the U.S. is about 2 or 3% people will respond. To this survey, 87% of the people responded. One of them was three pages long, the impact that it had on that father and daughter. So what I want to do now, we're almost done. I want to show you that one promotion in Kansas City became a nationwide phenomenon at Chick-fil-A. Now every Chick-fil-A does it. I want to give you a picture of what it looks like to do dad. They really upped the game on daddy-daughter date night. I want to show you what it looks like now. When I walked in the door, um, it was a, an amazing sight. There's, of course, so many people, um, but I'm really impressed at the detail this Chick-fil-A has gone into this night. The decorations, the pink tool, and the um, balloons everywhere. The tablecloth, the flowers, the little candles on the table. They've got a limo service taking it around the shopping center. Uh, the, the folks that are coming up, the staff, they're waiting on us hand and foot. And it's, it's, it's five stars. We decided to come because it's a good opportunity for us to get away from the hustle and bustle that you know the household brings sometimes, that the job brings, and just, just bond as a, as a family unit without mom. It's usually me and my brothers and my dad, plus they're annoying, so it's nice to get uh, away from them a while just with my dad. As life goes on and time changes things and she gets older, I think it's these times that's going to make a difference. As a family, this night means a lot about spending time with each other. <laughs> we live in such a busy, fast-paced society. It's good to slow down a little bit and uh, spend time with her. Kids need that quality time. I think it's really special, like, being here because it's just me and my dad. Like, there's not tons of people, like, with the group of us. My favorite part is that we, is that I can't My favorite part about tonight is just seeing her be excited and just, just being with her. I mean, we have fun together. I just love being with her. Favorite thing about her, she's my best friend. On our way here, she said, uh, Daddy, I love spending time with you. As you can see, as you look around, there's dads and daughters getting out of the hectic life and just sitting here and connecting and spending time together and, and just hanging out. Tonight is a night that we will remember for a very long time. It will stick in our memories for a long time on a baby. It was nice See, if I had spent my life selling chicken sandwiches, fries, and drinks, I would have quit a long time ago. But if we're doing that, Sign me up. We're just using our business platform to improve the stories for those we do business with. Kind of like building a church to build a nation and a great way to build a business. So, um, to create value, you've got to think outside the box. You've probably heard that expression a lot of times. But I think there's one level deeper that business people have to go. To create value, we've got to think outside the bill the dollar bill. We gotta think outside the bill. Truett said this, nearly every moment of every day, we have the opportunity to give something to someone else. Our time, 
our love, our resources. I've always found more joy in giving when I did not expect anything in return. Did you hear that? I've always found more joy in giving when I did not expect anything in return. If the purpose of a business is return on investment, then by definition, we're expecting things in return. But if we'll give not expecting anything, God will use that not only to enrich the lives of the people we serve, but enrich our own business as well. What if we found a business that believed the best in each other, wanted the best for each other, and expected the best from each other? What if you found a business desiring to be rich toward you, not get rich from you? What if you found a business that desired to create value for you, didn't spend all day thinking about ways to extract value from you? Wouldn't that be remarkable? Wouldn't you like to do business with a company like that? Wouldn't you like to work for a company like that? See, if we get this right, people will flock to you. You might do $5 million in an industry that does $800,000 per copy. But if we get it wrong, you'll spend years competing on price and incentives. If we get this right, your daily work will be filled with remarkable experiences. But if we get it wrong, your remarkable experiences won't start till after work, if not after retirement. See, nothing is as commonplace as to wish to be remarkable. My wish for you is that each of you would leave with your perspective changed and that you would go forth and that nothing would be as commonplace for the people in this world, or in this room, excuse me, as to choose to be remarkable because it is a remarkable way to live and the results that you'll achieve and the the riches that you'll create in your own life will be remarkable as well. Thank you so much for letting me be with you this morning.